In this week's update, US financial conditions are tightening. What does it mean for stocks? This correction is a gift for the patient, and precious metals are rocketing. My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is General Advice Only, and please remember to like and subscribe to the video. Big week, um, pretty poor in America on the surface, but as always, you've got to look underneath the hood to see what's really going on, and I think uh, some people might be a little bit surprised by some of the things that I'll show you in this video. <clears throat> So there's no question, so this is fact, US credit is tightening. We've got credit spreads, which is an indication of risk, are widening. So that's, uh, that's more of a risk-off sort of attitude and a reflection of the fact that, um, that credit is, is getting tighter, harder to get. Bond yields are rising. The 10-year yield is up to 4.6. And it's obvious now that we've got fewer and later rate cuts in America, and who knows, perhaps none, uh, if the inflation data uh, stays as it has been in recent weeks. So no question credit is tightening, and there is a, a very, very strong correlation between the availability of credit and the direction of the US major indices. Um, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's 100%, but it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty close. The oct let's let's step back a little bit and you know, look at where we've come from from the lows in October when the rally started, and that rally was all about easing conditions, which were real, um, but also the perception that that interest rates would come down and conditions would get much easier, um, and there was and as a consequence of that, the market was happy to pay higher PE multiples. Be because of it, because they expected rates to be lower. And so that affects sentiment, but it also goes into the, the calculation models that analysts use to value stocks. And stocks at a lower interest rate are going to be valued more highly. So all that sort of made sense, but a lot of it was built on expectation and perception. And that expectation and perception is now getting getting exploded. And the other thing that's really interesting, and this one sort of snuck up on me a bit, because so much of the American uh, process is about who beats expectations and who doesn't. And so the focus is not necessarily on earnings growth quarter to quarter, year to year. It's more about what, what were the expectations and did the company beat it? And I was quite surprised to see that the S&P uh, earnings, the S&P 500 as a whole, the earnings have actually been steady for the last three years. So we've had earnings not growing. Yes, we've had, so that's an average, uh, but earnings not growing at the average level. Obviously, some companies are growing their earnings in spectacular fashion, so that therefore there must be a whole bunch that, that aren't. And they're the ones that you don't want to own. But overall, the S&P is steady, and yet the multiple has gone up. And a good reason that the multiple has gone up is because much of the S&P return was about the Magnificent Seven, which uh, everybody knows which stocks they are. So the earnings season, which is just getting into gear, and next week is uh, quite possibly the biggest week of the year. It might be the week after that, but there's, uh, there's nearly 150 Stocks in the S and P 500 are reporting next week, including some of the tech majors. So next week's earnings are absolutely critical for where we go next um, for the index. I'll get to the charts in just a minute. So we've got a couple of wild cards. We've got a couple of unknowns. We've always got those, but at the moment. These, these ones are potentially more significant than normal. And that is, there really isn't a geopolitical discount in stocks. If things really erupt into all-out war in the Middle East, then let's all hope that that doesn't happen. Um, but if it, if it was, stocks really aren't priced for that. So that would be the first unknown, the first wild card. And the, and the second wild card is a bit of a consequence of that. If that happens, then oil prices could easily, very easily spike above 100 um, very, very quickly. And that, of course, would feed into 
renewed inflation, and then you get the you know, you're back into the whole cycle. Then with well, we, and what does that do for for rate cuts, which were expected, and and so on and so forth. So that that is the big unknown, and it's it's rather difficult to anticipate because it's not much more than a than a guess, really. Um, so all we can work on is that things stay as they appear to be at the moment, and that's really the best that you can do. So it's really a time for calm, clear thinking, because there's always opportunities, no matter what is going on. There's no question that money flows have shifted, um, but it's not a general change. And this is one of the key messages I want to get across this morning, is that the significant uh, downward move in the US indices last week is not a reflection of money deserting the market. This is a rotation, and I'll come to that uh, in just a minute. So rather than being a time to significantly step back from the market and, and be concerned that we could get a, a quite a significant correction here, this is a time to be on high alert for great buys because when emotion is running, you know, running high, then really good stocks can be sold off with, with the ones that deserve to be sold off. So that's the message. This is a rotation. This is not a general desertion of the market. Great opportunities are presenting themselves and, um, you know, it's, it's time to, uh, time to do really well. But before you do that, the very first thing that you need to do is to have a target list in the right areas in the areas that are going to move positively. And if you don't know how to do that and stay on top of it, and the second part is really the more difficult one, is staying on top of it because it's a pretty dynamic, fluid situation out there. So not only have you got to have a target list, but it's got to be continually refreshed and up to date. So if you don't know how to do that, um, why don't you come and join me in the Insiders Club for, uh, for a couple of months and, and see what we do. Um, we've, we've been doing very well. So yeah, bit of a bit of an advertisement. I don't do it very often, but um, but I I remain as enthusiastic as ever for the for the balance of 2024. Let's jump in and look at some charts. We'll start with the S and P first of all. So last week I said that aggressive growth was still resilience. This is last Sunday. Well, that changed <laughs> significantly during the week. I also said that the market had taken, this is on a weekly chart, so you can see here's where we were last Sunday. We'd taken another step towards a retest of 4,800, which if it plays out that way, would be a perfectly normal and healthy retracement. So nothing to be feared. It's just, you know, you, you can't, we can't keep going as, as we were from the lows in October. So that would be perfectly healthy <clears throat> and certainly in the last uh, week, we took an even bigger step towards that target and closed at 49.67, closed just under the, the 5,000 mark. So also last week, I said that the fundamentals were no longer justifying the indices being at these levels. And well, that turned out to be a, a, um, a pretty spot on comment. But I did say that the money flows said otherwise. So the fundamentals didn't justify it, but the money flows did. Well, Guess what? The money flows uh, certainly shifted in part, but it's not as significant as you might think just looking at the S&P uh, and the NASDAQ. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight just quickly is this is, this is a chart of the actual S&P 500 earnings going back to uh, early in 2021. So you can see that we had a peak in uh, at the end of 2021 and we're not even quite back to that peak at the end of 2023 so yes over the last three years there's been earnings growth but over the last two years um, there actually hasn't been in fact it's slightly gone backwards so that gives you an idea of given how much the S&P has gone up um, just how much has been led by um, the, the earnings growth of, um, of technology. 
Okay. Um, so the challenge, and I, you know, I talk about this just every week, finding the stocks that are going to rise despite what the rest of the general market is doing. And there's two parts to that. You've, you've got to have the target list and you've got to have the process to take advantage because if you don't have the process, you won't have the confidence to pull the trigger, particularly at times like this. When we're getting sell-offs like this in the market and there's a lot of negative commentary, unless you are really clear and confident about your process, you will find it very difficult to pull the trigger. It just is. And so you need to be very clear about process as well as having uh, the targets. And only a relatively small part of the market is is going to move up in this sort of environment. But I can tell you there are some stocks that are moving up very, very robustly. We're not just talking about, you know, a percent here and there. I'm talking about very significant gains, 10, 20, 30% in a week. So, you know, that is still out there. Now, last week, 41 of the S&P 500 companies reported, 32 had earnings that beat expectations. So, you know, that's pretty good. So from an earnings perspective, that was fine. But that's beating expectations. That doesn't necessarily mean that earnings are growing. Six missed consensus and three were in line. So that was last week. Um, So not too bad, really. Now, this week coming, we've got 145 reporting, including um, some of the tech majors. So this week coming is huge because, you know, the market is priced for a certain level of earnings and expectations. And and if it doesn't get it, it's going to stamp its feet. And, you know, we saw on Friday night, I think it was Netflix was down 9%. They actually beat expectations, but... In their outlook, they, they said they were no longer going to report subscriber numbers or something to that effect. So they got marked down 9%. So the market is very, very savage on anything at all that it doesn't like in this sort of environment. All right, let me, uh, let me have a quick look at a couple of key charts. So there's the NASDAQ versus the S&P. Quite a significant shift to risk off, as you can see, NASDAQ being a more aggressive index than the S&P. And if we look at the NASDAQ, you can see quite, um, quite concerted selling all week. We had a bit of a pause on Tuesday, but otherwise the rest of the week was, was quite concerted selling. Now, if we look at um, semiconductors, this is where a lot of um, the, the whole technology sector was sold off sharply, but none more so than semiconductors. SMH reflects that. NVIDIA was down 10% on Friday, just in sympathy for what, to what else was going on, from what I can gather. Um, I'm not aware of anything specifically about NVIDIA, but 10% is a, is a huge, huge move. Um, AMD, other majors, Advanced Micro down 5.5, Broadcom down 4.5, Taiwan Semiconductors 3.5, and, and ASML similar. So you can look at that and think, whoa, what's changed? Has AI suddenly become on the nose? Are semiconductors suddenly going into some sort of negative growth mode? Um, And it's too early to say at this stage because we need to see what the market follow through is because sometimes in the very short term, you get a bit of selling in these high multiple stocks. It triggers stop losses. And then you get a cascade effect that can last a few days. So, you know, I'm not panicking yet about semiconductors. In fact, I'm not panicking about semiconductors at all. Of of course, AI is going to continue to to grow rapidly as it has been, and semiconductors are an absolutely key part of that. So this, this is definitely an emerging opportunity, but certainly not yet. You don't want to, you don't want to, wander onto the railway tracks in front of something that's doing this. But there will be a point where there'll be some incredible bargains in semiconductors. Now let me just take that a little further. So I just want to look at 
SMH. So I'm, I'm always looking at things from both sides rather than, you know, my, my natural orientation is bullish. I think everyone that watches this video knows that. And that's justified because over the long term, markets always rise. Um, but let's, let's have a look at the other side and just see if there's any similarities to when technology and particularly semiconductors fell apart at the end of 2021, just to make sure. So let's go back to that. So there was, there was the end of uh, 2021 right there. So semiconductors had been rising very, very strongly, as you can see. Uh, then we had a period of sideways <clears throat> that lasted about, um, about two months or a little under two months. Uh, and then we got a, a first move down below the 200 day moving average. And we fluctuated around the 200 day moving average uh, for around about three months. And during that time, of course, the 200 day moving average flattened out and the shorter term moving averages had all rolled over and was starting to head down. So that process took about uh, three or four months from when the upward momentum stopped to when you could say, well, you know, we're, we're in strife here and we're, uh, and we're heading down. And you can see that it headed down for quite some time that took it, in fact, it headed down for nearly 18 months. So this was, oh, sorry, not 18 months, um, about six months from March to October of 2022. So just, you know, have a, have that picture in your mind and let's wind forward to now and see if there are similarities. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that we had a little period of sideways. So that's the, we've had a powerful upward momentum phase. Then we've gone sideways, but we're nowhere near cutting the 200 day moving average, not even within QE of it yet. So it is far too premature to be saying that we're entering a period like we got into in the start of 2022. Um, yes, the shorter term moving averages are rolling over, but we're, you know, we know we're near cutting the 200 day. So that's sort of off the table. And if we look at XLK, it's a very similar, very similar situation. It looks, looks quite the same as, as SMH. That process took from um, from mid to late November until when we sort of really got going. It was it was into April, so it looks very similar. So that's the uh, that's the situation with uh, semiconductors and technology. And if we look at the Magnificent Seven, Nvidia, Meta, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, and Tesla. You can see Apple and Tesla have been making heavy weather of it for some time. NVIDIA, Meta, Amazon in particular had done well, particularly the first two. And they've come off the boil. NVIDIA came off the boil significantly on, um, on Friday. Uh, Google has held up pretty well. And so has Microsoft, really. So that's, you know, that's the situation with, with big tech. and. It's, it's a week of significant rotation into other areas of the market, but it is by no means a showstopper for, um, for the U.S. market, that's for sure. There's semiconductors versus the S&P, so that speaks to itself. The, there is no question the character has changed. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not disputing that at all. The character has changed. And I don't think that is going to be an overnight thing. I do not expect semiconductors just to bounce straight back. I think this will now be the part of a, um, a more meaningful consolidation, whether it takes weeks or months. I don't know. And where the bottom is, I don't yet. It's too early to say. But what I can tell you is there will be some unbelievably good opportunities like what was presented at the end of 2022, when you could buy NVIDIA for a relative song and, and it then went up three, four, five hundred percent, whatever the number was. So that situation, I think, will present itself similarly again. Let's look at the relative comparison charts over the last quarter. 
energy remains in the lead. Uh, but look, the key ones are look at what plummeted last week. XLK, and we'll look at the two weekly one in a minute, but XLK, XLY, consumer discretionary, absolutely plummeted. And also um, XLC, communication services, which had been going very well, it also plummeted. So the three, they're the three key sectors that fell last week the most and, and the, certainly the most on Friday. If we look at this on a fortnightly chart, you can see consumer staples did really well. So you know, finally, finally, we're getting a response um, of money going a bit more defensive. Uh, energy did really well because oil obviously uh, did well. Uh, healthcare um, turned up a little bit on Friday and so did financials. But as I said, it was XLK, XLY, and XLC where the damage was really done. Turning to Australia over the last quarter, uh, everything has been heading down in the last uh, few weeks. I don't believe that XIJ, which is our information technology sector, it, it's a very different composition to the American uh, technology sector. Um, so it, it may not be all that buoyant while this is playing out in America, but I don't think it's going to get the smashing that, uh, that semiconductor sectors are going to get because we just don't have those sorts of stocks. So that's the, uh, that's the overall situation uh, in America. So the S&P was down 3.05% for the week. The NASDAQ dropped five and a half. So that was very significant. And it all looks really, really horrid. But the Dow Jones actually went up on Friday. And six other sectors, six of the 11 sectors went up. And three, there was only three that fell by a meaningful amount. And I've covered which ones they were, technology, communication services, and consumer discretionary. So when you look at that, this, this is not a desertion of the market. This is a rotation. This is a move out of uh, stocks that had run an enormous distance and were trading on high multiples. Um, and, you know, a couple of things that the market didn't, didn't particularly like, but it, it's really hard to anticipate what the next couple of weeks look like. And who knows, if, if big tech comes through with good earnings reports next week, you know, I could be saying something completely different next Sunday, painting a much more positive picture. But I think at the moment, given, given the rapidly disappearing chance of rate cuts in America, which had been priced in, um, given the tensions in the Middle East, I just think it pays, as I said last week, it pays to be a bit conservative at the moment, but it's certainly not a time to be, to be dumping stocks, that's for sure. Now, the US dollar index uh, spiked uh, a little, 106.12, uh, but really it was not, not a lot of change there, to be honest. The 10-year yield was up to 4.63 and the VIX up to uh, 18.7. We've got about another 130, uh, so, sorry, about 160 odd points down to the 4,800 target on the S&P. So I think we'll see, we'll certainly probably see some strong buying coming in at that level. Turning to Australian stocks, um, the Aussie dollar finished down under 64. Our index fell 2.8% across the week. I would expect a gap down open on Monday. Uh, but after that, who knows? We might end up being like the Dow and, and steadying fairly quickly because the composition is so very different from the US indices. And that is especially so in the industry groups uh, that fell the heaviest and the, and the sectors that fell the heaviest in the US. We really by and large, don't have that you know, presence in our market. What was obvious last week was that commodities uh, were in favour, particularly precious metals, but uh, generally commodities showed pretty good resistance last week. Let's just have a, uh, a quick look at uh, the ASX 200. So it's a weekly chart. We came, we've, we'd broken out 
um, a number of weeks ago, eight, 10 weeks ago, but we've popped back under that breakout zone. This, this week will be, be fairly telling. But I'm not expecting anything terribly dramatic in Australia outside of the, you know, probably the inevitable panic on the, on the open on Monday. <clears throat> so that's the Australian market. Let's look at um, precious metals while we're here. This is silver, silver on a daily chart. Had a, uh, had a pretty decent week. We had a, a really huge move last uh, Friday. And interestingly, we had uh, another really strong night on Friday, much stronger than gold actually on Friday to finish the week. So um, ended up ended up lower for the week, but looking very positive, if you understand what I mean. So that was silver. This is gold on a, uh, on a daily chart. So you can see there certainly was a bit of selling up here above uh, 2,400. But if we put that on a weekly chart, you can see more clearly just the incredible acceleration that we've had in the gold chart uh, since um, since the breakout. Oh, sorry, that's the Australian dollar gold price. Beg your pardon. Let me put this on a weekly. There we go. There's the weekly chart. So it's been a huge acceleration since since the breakout. And the Australian, the Australian dollar gold price finished at thirty seven thirty three. That's very very profitable territory for Australian gold miners. All right, so just summarising precious metals, uh, gold another fifty dollars, so it should be good for gold stocks and uh, and silver stocks in our market. Um, it's surprising the the movement in gold because we had a strong US dollar. The US dollar was was uh, strong throughout the week. We've still got outflows from ETFs, but surely, surely that's got to start to, to shift back again. But all of that, all of those potential negatives for the gold price is being swamped out by central bank buying, which tells you a lot about the, the shifting sands in, in world geopolitics and world trade. So 37.33 is where we finished. When we look at stocks, um, the response is not general yet, particularly in the Australian market. There are only a, a more minor part of gold stocks are moving up, but it is starting to look better. There is definitely more interest there, and especially so with those gold stocks that have got real merit, that have found something of real substance, um, you know, not pulling the sky stuff. And really, you've got to forget the rubbish. You know, the rubbish has a brief day in the sun at the end of the cycle, and everyone is able to enjoy some spectacular gains for a very short period of time and then probably get their fingers burnt. One of the things you've got to recognize about a lot of the, the mining sector, and particularly the gold sector, is that many of these companies exist to pay the wages of the people that run them. And, and you can see that very clearly because the number of shares on issue just seems to go up substantially year after year after year. The board owns next to nothing, so there's, there's no disincentive for them just to keep raising capital. It just keeps the wheel turning, but keeps diluting shareholders. And that is, in my experience, the majority of the mining sector out there. So they're the ones that you've got to avoid. Yet they're the ones that are often marketed heavily with a, you know, with a, a very fancy piece of bait. Um, so just be careful of that part of the market. But having said that, there is some, uh, absolutely wonderful opportunities in precious metals in Australia. Other commodities, copper. I had a great week. So did nickel. Copper 450. Nickel, which was wasn't that long ago, it was down in the low sevens. We're now at 869 and just how rapidly the outlook has changed that all of a sudden the bearish um, major bank analysts that were falling over themselves to tell you about the surplus we were going to have in copper this year um, and how the, you know, the price wasn't going to go up for years to come. All of a sudden they seem to be falling over themselves to tell you about the deficit. So it's changed very, very rapidly. Uh, crude oil 
has been uh, pretty volatile, but actually ended up down a bit on the week. Um, it's just such a tough sector to anticipate globally the way the way things are uh, are playing out at the moment in the Middle East. And then when it comes to Australia, I just leave Australian energy stocks alone and have done for years. Australian energy policy is just an absolute disgrace. And not only on energy, but on other things such as defence, healthcare, whatever it might be, there is no political guts for critically needed reform that we've needed for, for decades. And just, you know, no one's got the guts anymore to do it. It's just simple vote chasing while the rest of Rome burns. And it pains me to say that, but that is our reality. And I just hope that we can get some some politicians or people stand up that have got good, hard business experience that can run this country properly because the group we've got at the moment cannot. That's my rant for the day. There's the spot copper chart, $4.50. We're up above now, so that's looking really, really positive. There's nickel also turning back up against the, you know, all the bad news about the supply glut coming out of Indonesia, but obviously there's some support coming back in for, for nickel now. Wrapping it all up, I know it's been a bit of a long one, but uh, important to paint the perspective because that's really what this Sunday video is about. It's, it's about providing a, an independent perspective on the market, you know, not getting caught up in, in the hype and the fundamental logic, just looking at where money is going, where, where, are, where are the big players committing their funds? So don't let the last two weeks spook you because it shouldn't. There is no reason to. This is a, a, a partial correction of parts of the market that were overvalued and we're getting rotation into other parts of the market. Perfectly normal, perfectly healthy and Whilst it is uncomfortable, you know, I get that. It's, it's just something that has to happen. So it's certainly not a time to be, to be making, you know, radical shifts in your positioning. Now, some caution is warranted because some of the fundamentals have shifted. And the, the biggest fundamental that shifted is the rate cuts. There's going to be a lot less of them, if any, and they're, going to, they're not going to come until at least September and possibly even later. And that was what was priced in the market. So the fundamentals have shifted, no question. And the market has finally started reacting to that. But this is where, this is where I'm going to bang the table. This is where the really good money gets made. This is the time that you want to, you want to cheer on. The only question is, have you got the process to make it work? Because the process gives you the confidence knowing that you've, you've got a process that over time produces a positive outcome. If you've got the target stocks in the right areas that are going to continue to grow their earnings and that aren't expensive now, so the price can move up. If you've got the focus and the discipline to take advantage, because that, that's the part that most people lack. So if you've got all those things, fabulous. I reckon you're going to have a pretty good year. If you don't, then you really need some help. You need some assistance. And that's most people because most people don't do what I do. They don't live and breathe this stuff 24 seven because they've got careers and families and what have you. So that's part of the function I provide. Now, portfolio analysts last week, um, we looked at just where to focus the attention over the next three months. So, you know, I was already in cautious mode at the start of last week. And so we, we looked at where to take advantage, where to position, and also, of course, naturally the outlook for, for precious metals. There's a $1 trial for portfolio analysts, which gives you an opportunity to get a, a great deal of very valuable information, uh, lessons, strategy, what have you. But the real flagship and where the real value is, is in the Insiders Club. So if you really want some input, that's, that's going to help you take advantage of the rest of 2024 and do very well, then you know, it's the Insiders Club. And I would strongly encourage uh, anyone that's thinking that way, come and join us. It's just a month-by-month -month membership. 
you're going to learn a hell of a lot. Good chance you'll you'll probably make some profit, and um, and you know it's it's just uh, it's been been working well. So that's the um, that's the flying the flag for the services that I provide. And I look forward to uh, to next week with with a great deal of enthusiasm. There is um, there is the um, information regarding the website and and also my email, email address. And just backtracking a little, our track record of late in the Insiders Club has has been has been good. It's been profitable, but equally, I've got to point out that, of course, in the market, you can always you can always go the other way. You can always incur losses, particularly if you don't do things the right way. But making money in the market is about probabilities. It's about positioning yourself to be on the right side of the ledger the majority of the time. And, um, and you know, that's the way that the processes work. That's it for this week. I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.